Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and you know there are many wonderful organizations on the American and world Jewish scene who make special contributions to Jewish life and the Jewish people every single day. And none of them have done more than has B'nai B'rith International, a Jewish service organization that's been enhancing Jewish life worldwide for some 170 years. This is their 170th anniversary since 1843, when a visionary German-Jewish immigrant to America named Henry Jones helped to create B'nai B'rith to address the then very difficult conditions many Jewish immigrants to the new Golden Land were confronting. Since then, B'nai B'rith has been responsible for erecting the first Jewish community center in the United States for establishing the first Jewish public library in the United States, the Maimonides Library of New York. In the aftermath of this country's brutal civil war, B'nai B'rith founded the most modern orphanage of its time, the Cleveland Jewish Orphan Home. And in 1868, when a cholera epidemic plagued pre-state Palestine, B'nai B'rith organized its first overseas philanthropic project to aid the Jewish pioneer community in Eretz Yisrael. Throughout its illustrious history, B'nai B'rith has been a vocal and active leader in defense of Israel and in defense of human rights in general, and is an outstanding presence at the UN and other international organizations. And to serve the aged of the Jewish community, B'nai B'rith has created a network of 40 senior residences in more than 25 communities throughout the United States and around the world. And B'nai B'rith is the largest national Jewish sponsor of housing for seniors. And this just gives you a taste of the contribution B'nai B'rith International makes to Jewish life worldwide. And on this edition of L'Chaim, I am honored to be joined by two individuals who are helping to lead B'nai B'rith International at this time. On my left, Alan Jacobs, president of B'nai B'rith International. On my right, someone you've met before on Shalom TV, Daniel Mariashin, executive vice president. And it is wonderful to have both of you sitting at this table. And I want to begin by saying Mazal Tov on the 170th anniversary of B'nai B'rith as we tape. Congratulations to both of you and thank, thank, you. You, thank you for taking some time to be here. There's so much I want to just make sure our audience knows about the work you're doing, the organization, B'nai B'rith International. But first, a moment about each of you. So, Alan... What's your day job when you're not helping to lead the, you know, you're not making your contribution to Jewish life worldwide, what do you do? Well, I was the managing partner of a CPA firm. I'm now of counsel to them. And in addition, I am chairman of the board of a bank. That is wonderful. How did you get involved in B'nai B'rith? Well, I grew up with B'nai B'rith. Uh, my father was active, was, had been a president of our lodge way back in the 1929-1930 era. And so I grew up with B'nai B'rith and have been a uh, member since I uh, was old enough to be. And where was he? Where did he live? He lived in uh, the town called Waukegan, Illinois. Uh, maybe you were more, from, or your listeners might be more for fam familiar with it as the home of Jack Benny. Uh -huh. And actually, Jack Benny's father was one of the founders of our lodge. Isn't that wonderful? By the way, it's interesting. We recently had Jack Benny's daughter, Joan Benny, on L'chaim, and it was interesting for me to learn, which I did not know the extent to which Jack Benny, who despite the television persona was a very generous man, also was in, intimately involved in Israel bonds and helping the state of Israel. So it's lovely to hear this about you. Uh, and how, what was it personally for you that attracted you to work with B'nai B'rith? And again, you live in Chicago, correct? Outside Chicago. Chicago area. Okay. 
So what was it that, if you had to explain to people why this is where you put some of, so much of your time and your effort, Alan, what's the reason? Well, I would say that uh, the programs of B'nai B'rith is what attracted me to uh, B'nai B'rith, and it's a reach which is throughout the world. As you know, we're in over 50 countries around the world. The people that we touch, the uh, defense of the state of Israel is so important to us, and uh, the programs that B'nai B'rith has. And so it's an opportunity to put my little effort that I can into making uh, the world better for uh, Jews throughout. That is wonderful. So I come to you, Dan, and again, thank you for being in person. We've spoken on the phone a couple of times, and you do extraordinary work for the Jewish community. So first of all, how do you get involved as a professional in Jewish life? Well, I don't have 170 years, but I've got 40, <laughs> 40 years uh, working in Jewish life. I, I uh, went to graduate school at Brandeis uh, in the Hornstein program, which trains uh, folks to go out and work in the Jewish community and um, since 1973 I've been out there worked with the Jewish Community Relations Council in Boston uh, then with the WZO World Zionist Organization also in Boston had an office there at that time um, then went to New York uh, worked for uh, the Anti-Defamation League for a number of years came to Washington uh, in the mid 80s went to work for APAC and uh, then to B'nai B'rith in 1988. So That's I've lovely. been there for 25 years. What kind of home did you have growing up, Jewish home? I lived in New Hampshire. So there weren't a lot of Jews. Where in New Hampshire? In, just outside Keene, New Hampshire. Keene, New Hampshire. So I we, was a rabbi in Laconia, New Hampshire. I, I had relatives in Laconia. <laughs> okay. um, in Weir's Beach, actually. <laughs> we had, and, you, and you, from your experience you'd know this, we had 25 Jewish families in a 25-mile in a radius. So exactly, we really, exactly. But a small synagogue, and we had a Hebrew school, and we had a rabbi from time to time. Uh, but, you know, it was around the dinner table. It really was that kind of input from my parents uh, that really uh, was responsible, both for my sisters and myself, for getting us onto that path Who of your Jewish parents? identity. My parents were immigrants. My father from Russia, my mother from Lithuania. Brought Their names? To Saul and Rose Mary Ashen. Okay. And they had a sense of Jewish identity they passed on to you. There wasn't a day that went by that we didn't connect something mm -hmm. to, uh, to some issue relating to Israel, relating to, to anti-Semitism, relating to uh, anything uh, that uh, was interesting uh, in terms of Jewish culture. So that really was responsible for me uh, to, to move into organized Jewish life. Very interesting. Did you feel that you came from a Zionist-oriented home? Absolutely, absolutely. We had relatives. Our first relatives came to Israel in the early 30s, and there was a photograph of them on our, on our fireplace, on the mantelpiece. So there wasn't a day that I didn't go by, even as a little kid, seeing that picture, and there was already that connection to Israel. Wow. Alan, was there any sense of Zionism in your home growing up? There was a sense, although uh, it was uh, not as uh, detailed as perhaps uh -huh. as Dan's, because uh, my family had been in the States here since the 1860s and actually wound up in the, uh, out in the Dakotas in Wyoming uh, in the 1860s My and guess 70s. is there are fewer Jews in Dakotas than even Laconia, New Hampshire. Uh, that is true. My grandmother, my grandfather died when, I, uh, when he, my father was only two. So my grandmother, they ran the general store, although his uh, grandfather had opened up a uh, it, when gold was discovered in the Black Hills there back in 1877. So, but to get a minion for the high holidays, they had to go about 100 miles. Yeah, that was a challenge, wasn't that it? That was a challenge. You know, an interesting story is in uh, the famous town of Deadwood, South Dakota. There is a national cemetery called Mount Moriah Cemetery, and so as you walk in, you get a copy of the map, and there is a Hebrew section of this. The, of this cemetery really? up at the hill where I have three generations starting with my grandparents buried in the Hebrew section there about a hundred yards from where, where Calamity Jane and Weldon Hickok are buried just to give you a little perspective. Mm -hmm. You know Dan described the Jewish feeling of his home. Did you have any Jewish feeling growing up? Were your parents involved in Jewish life at all? Oh yes. My father had been president of our synagogue and as a matter of fact 
the town of Waukegan is right next to the naval base, Great Lakes, the largest naval base. During World War II, uh, there were so many Jewish sailors there that we had a USO that was a Jewish USO, which is probably unique in the USO system. My father, being too old to be served in the military during the war, he was president of that USO. And uh, so we had a uh, relationship and a lot with a lot of these as well as at the synagogue itself. And what were your parents' names? Uh, Ralph Jacobs and Minnie Jacobs. Okay. Well, I know you've made them very, very proud, and both of you have done extraordinary work in your own way. Um, so help clarify something for our audience, and we talked about this a moment before we went on the air. When I was growing up, there was an organization called B'nai B'rith ADI, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. And Dan, take a moment to explain the historical sort of sweep. At one point, ADL was associated with B'nai B'rith, and, it, and since it has now, in essence, become its own organization. But speak to that for a moment. Well, you know, B'nai B'rith has uh, been called the great incubator of Jewish life, uh, giving birth to the Anti-Defamation League in 1913. Uh, but also to Hillel, to B'nai B'rith Youth Organization, uh, three organizations that uh, today are standing on their own. Um, so we um, uh, have contributed a great deal to building civil society, not only in America, orphanages, hospitals, uh, but also within our own community, mm -hmm. serving every level of demographic in the Jewish community. So ADL was founded in, 18, in 1913, and uh, was a, originally a commission, because we're organized that way, a commission of B'nai B'rith. And as it grew, uh, it became located in New York, B'nai B'rith was in Washington, and uh, ultimately uh, ADL uh, became uh, independent. But uh, we take great pride in the fact that uh, we gave birth to it. Yes, it, and it too makes an enormous contribution. Absolutely. Now run by Abe Foxman, and we were talking before, it was run by Nate Perlmutter before that, and Arlen Forster was a great leader of the ADL back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, you know, I heard, sort of gave an overview of the B'nai B'rith history, especially its origin. But I would like the two of you to give our audience a sense of what about B'nai B'rith now, the programming, the projects, are ones that you feel are especially relevant, meaningful, that you wish every Jew in America understood. Dan, begin for us. Well, in terms of pro-Israel advocacy, I think that um, uh, that uh, is perhaps most important mm -hmm. today. Uh, that's part of our public policy uh, programmatic uh, thrust. Uh, you mentioned the UN. We were present when the UN was founded in 1945 in San Francisco. The UN has become um, a, uh, uh, a place where Israel is uh, bashed, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in New York or it's in Geneva at the Human Rights Council or at UNESCO in Paris or wherever it is, singled out, treated to a double standard. With our accreditation at the UN, it gives us an opportunity to speak out with some authority because we are accredited there, uh, have an opportunity, for example, in Geneva at the Human Rights Council to actually make presentations from the floor of the Human Rights Council uh, when Israel is, is singled out, and it is singled out uh, frequently. Forgive me. Are other Jewish organizations also accredited at the United Nations? There are other organizations that are accredited. For example? Uh, I think WITSO is, is, is in New York, um, and the, uh, the Blaustein Institute, uh, which, is, which is the AJC. But we were, our uh, connection really goes back to, to the very, very first days of the organization. And don't you feel B'nai B'rith does have, or assumes, I should say, a very special role in speaking out on Jewish issues at the UN? Yeah, and I'll tell you why I think it's special. As Alan mentioned, we have members in nearly 50 countries. Um, all of us are interested in, in the, the grand sweep of issues that affect us, global anti-Semitism, the situation that Israel is in, the Iranian nuclear program, and we can go through the BDS movement, the, the demonization and delegitimization movement. So it takes, you know, with apologies, it takes a village yes, to does. really <laughs> to confront this. Having said that, I think what separates us out in a way is that we actually do have members on the ground in these places. So when we're talking, for example, about a Shrita problem in Europe or a Brit Milah problem in Europe, we have members 
and branches in whether it's Sweden or it's Germany or it's any of these other countries that I think gives us an edge in, in understanding perhaps a little bit better um, the problems uh, that, uh, that we're facing, not only in those particular countries, but as a people. Mm -hmm. But when you and I spoke, you were in Paris. We spoke on the phone. You were in Paris. And at that point, you were working to try to get France to rule Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. You had a certain degree of success, and we talked about that. But that's an example also of some of the things that you and B'nai B'rath are doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, each year, for example, when the UN opens, uh, the General Assembly opening, uh, we uh, organize, there's a consortium of Jewish organizations, a small group of organizations um, that B'nai organizes, and we will meet with the heads of delegations, foreign ministers, prime ministers, presidents, who come in for the opening, and we have our agenda. It could be Iran, it could be the BDS issue, it could be what the EU is doing, um, it could be the peace process, all of that gives us an opportunity uh, to address directly uh, many of the, the world leaders who, who come into New York, all connected to the UN mm -hmm. in this case. Now, Alan, as we're meeting, you just came back from France yourself. Yes. Explain why you were there and what happened. Well, it was the, uh, there were two reasons that I went to. I was in France and then in Frankfurt, Germany. In France, uh, they were celebrating, B'nai B'rath France was celebrating its 80th anniversary. So they had a dinner there, and they also present a human rights award at that dinner every, and uh, so they did that as well. But I had the opportunity to speak to the uh, people there at the French. It was held in City Hall, which gave them the use of the this magnificent facility there in City Hall to you to hold their banquet. And you are the president of B'nai B'rith International. That's correct. Isn't it amazing what opportunities you have? to meet Jews from all over the world in the position you now have? Well, yes, it, it is. Plus, then I went to Frankfurt, yes. where we had a youth forum of youth, well, we call them youth, between 25 and 45 that were there from this year. Oh, kids, you mean. You, were, you mean with kids. <laughs> <laughs> they would not call themselves such. But these are uh, young adults who are interested in being active. Mm -hmm. They see B'nai B'rith as a vehicle for that activity. And they were there from 13 different countries, including Turkey, including uh, all the way from Argentina. Uh, so that it was primarily a European group, but they had in, the Argentines had asked to be there, and they had sent four young adults to uh, participate in this uh, forum there in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. So that was part of the reason. Uh, but uh, just to add to what Dan said, one of the things that always made is me is how much we can get volunteers to fill some of these roles. For example, at UNESCO, where volunteers are constantly monitoring, at Geneva, as Dan had said, and uh, here also at, in New York at the UN at times, although we have professional staff here, uh, we don't have in Geneva or Paris, but the volunteers fill that role. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's perhaps a little unique with some other it Jewish is, organizations yes. that these people will uh, will do the job that we try to do. Lovely people? Lovely people. Uh, they have people who qu quite often have worked in the UN structure and then as they got older and retired saw the need to become active in uh, volunteer work there for, for B'nai B'rith at, uh, at those locations. Excellent. Alan, I'm still trying to understand what is it you think that draws somebody to want to be involved in B'nai B'rith International? In other words, is there a profile? Is there a cause? Is there something where, of all the organizations you could be a part of, if somebody comes to B'nai B'rith International, they have an opportunity to do something which they might not have the opportunity to do if they were part of some other organization. What draws people to B'nai B'rith International? I would have to say that the ability to feel they're making an impact uh, without necessarily having to be the largest contributor that day. Uh, I'm not to cast an aspersion on other Jewish organizations, but a lot of them, those who, volunteers who seem to take the leadership role are those who are uh, substantial 
givers, I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. At B'nai B'rith, you, we offer the opportunity to uh, make that contribution, but we also offer them the opportunity to be involved in the, not only the decision making, but in helping us to uh, achieve our agenda. Irrespective of how much money they give. Irrespective of how much money That's they, they give. Do you feel there's truth to that, Dan? Do you like, uh, you want to add to it? To what extent do you, have you found that is one of the reasons well, I think that B'nai B'rith has, gives people a unique opportunity to participate irrespective of, of their level of wealth. I think that's true. I also think that today um, everything seems to be done for you. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a Duncan Hines world. It's all in a mix. And there still is a place for Jews to, to be involved. For example, when we go to Geneva, we take a delegation, nearly 20 people who go with us, and we fan out and we have meetings with the various delegations giving people an opportunity in a way to participate in public diplomacy in a way that they normally wouldn't do it. People feel they want to do something about the Iranian issue. They want to do something to help okay, Israel. And literally, what would they do through B'nai B'rith? We would brief them on the issues. Uh, they would come to Geneva. Not everybody, of course, does it. Not everybody is able to come. But they would come, and we would have uh, five groups of four. And over a course of a week, we would have uh, 30 meetings with uh, delegations from various countries. And there would be an opportunity for everybody to speak, for everybody to lay out the issues. They've prepared for it. They've studied the issues. Um, if I can move to another area, senior housing, which you mentioned. So we have 4,000 apartments. We have 7,500 residents around the country. You know, it's not only because of the biblical injunction to honor thy father and thy mother, but it's also because Jews have a larger proportion of aging. You know, we, we have fewer children and we live longer. So there's, a, there's a, a large proportion of aging. Every one of those 25 communities that you, that you referred to has a local board, a local board made up oftentimes of B'nai B'rith leaders, but uh, and others in the community who come together to serve seniors. It's their way of helping seniors to run those facilities. Or it could be disaster relief. You, you referenced uh, the cholera epidemic in, in uh, pre-state Palestine. Today it's Fukushima or it's, it's uh, Katrina. Now, um, we're not first responders, so we don't, we don't send people out. Although today we have a very good uh, partner in Israel, which is a terrific organization. B'nai B'rith was a founding member. And they do have water purification experts and they have paramedics and so forth. But uh, our uh, committee, we have a committee, and uh, it's, it's getting larger actually, that decides you know, which of these today, we have so many natural disasters because of, of cable and satellite, everybody knows instantly when there's a hurricane or when there's an earthquake. How, which one should we help? How do we, we like to help everybody, but which one should we should be focusing on? How can we help? And so there's an opportunity for people to be involved. So there are different, there are different levels and different ways of being involved. Um, it's, you know, we started out as a mass membership organization. Um, affiliation patterns have changed over the years. You know, people have sometimes less disposable time and in some cases more disposable income, but they don't have the time. So they will support the efforts that, that we're engaged in. But a lot of people do have time and they want to give it to something that means something for them to mm -hmm. help the Jewish people, help the Jewish community, and we provide that opportunity. But well, you said so well, and I want you to amplify on this last point you made. As you look at Jewish life, and you've been a Jewish professional for a long time, both of you have seen the evolution of the American Jewish community and the world Jewish community. To what extent do you feel that the younger generation, and again, we're going to call them 20, you know, 20 to 40, to what extent are you concerned that there is a diminishing commitment to Jewish life, to Jewish philanthropy. To what extent do you see things that encourage you? I'm not, and I don't want to lead you in either direction. I want as honest an assessment as I can have. Alan, what do you see? Are you worried about the next generation? Well, I'm worried about the next generation because of uh, primarily they're not as necessary in their lives as it was it perhaps in our lives to be uh, involved in Jewish matters. Let's face it, the younger Jewish people 
uh, adults, if you want to call them today, have a lot more opportunities and don't have the discrimination that we had perhaps when we were growing up. However, having said that, and having just been at this uh, youth forum, which had in Europe, there was a group of uh, 20 to 40 year olds, or 25 to 45 year olds, who were interested in what was going on. They want to participate, and we're seeing it. You know, it's unfortunate. Organizations seem to have lost that generation between ours and these 25 to 45. I don't know what happened, what caused it. I suppose psychologists will probably someday write a book about it. But for some reason, that generation was not identifying with Jewish organizations, and B'nai B'rith was not alone in that. The younger generation, there seems to be a little bit more concern. Now, part of it might be that some of them have gone to Israel on birthright or other programs that they have seen what Israel's about, and they have more coming back to their religion, perhaps. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm not as discouraged as might might otherwise have been. What's your answer? Uh, I, think yeah. it's a, I think it's a mixed picture. I've seen and met some of the folks that Alan has referenced in Europe. Uh, we have in our organization coming in some very impressive uh, young people who are looking for a way to get involved with the Jewish community. But I do think we've got a couple of issues here. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, a generational thing, if you will. You know, today, uh, you know, we worry about young people in their, in their 20s uh, and their connection to, to Israel. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that young people in their 20s have parents in their mid-40s or late 40s. Uh, the Six-Day War was 46 years ago. So there's the, the reference to that very, very important seminal event in my life. Or six years later, the Yom Kippur War, which faced Israel with existential issues. Uh, all of that is, is not part of, part of the mix. Then if you go on to the issue of, of Holocaust and what that means, uh, certainly in my case, born after the Holocaust, but close enough in terms of table talk, uh, in terms of hearing about relatives lost. Now it's true we have a lot of Holocaust education today. It's extremely important. We need more of it. Uh, we have birthright, which, which helps to fill that void on Israel. But I think there, there is that, that generational issue, which is beyond our control. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. That's the way the calendar is. It's the way the clock is. And we need to work on Jewish literacy. I think that's the answer. Jewish education, Jewish literacy, education literally um, about all things Jewish, and Jewish literacy in terms of, of, of cultural mm -hmm. issues and public policy issues to bring young people up to speed. And then at the end of the day, you know, it gets to that, that uh, question that has uh, plagued us or has uh, uh, tested us, rather, for, for so many generations, which is, uh, why is it important to be Jewish? You know, why, why, is it, why is it something special? And you have to be able to answer that question. It is something special. It is important. It is meaningful. Because? You're, you're part, because you're part of a continuum, and you're part of a continuum of history that has, that has given so much, really, to the world, so much to civilization, and so much to our own, to our own people. Uh, that's a tall order, um, maybe taller than Ben Abrith is able to, to no, handle but and think, everything, I, but, we, I, but we contribute exactly. to a lot of that. Exactly. I think, I, I, think well, I love the way we have sort of evolved to this point because it is exactly what Ben Abrith is about. And you understand that from my perspective, it's what Shalom TV is about. Why, why are we doing this? And we're a nonprofit like you guys are nonprofit. And we're here as a service like you are for the very reason you described. We want to educate and inform. I want people to know about B'nai B'rith International. It may be that because they've heard you, some people will you know, give you a call and maybe they'll become involved. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hoping for is that what you do and what we do will simply encourage more and more of our people to be involved on an active day-to-day -day level helping to ensure the Jewish future here in America and of course in the state of Israel. And so I want, you know, as we sort of wrap this up, I want you to give our viewers some information about how they can contact B'nai B'rith International, how they can become a part of it, how, can they, how they can participate. Dan? Well, it's, it's uh, become the clarion call of <laughs> www.b'naibrith.org. No apostrophes, no, no caps. Uh, the website is a good one. You can find out all kinds of information about it. 
Uh, we'll be glad to respond to everybody who, who makes an inquiry, and we uh, invite everybody to get involved with That's us. That's an invitation from you, Alan? Well, they, I would certainly uh, give that invitation to everyone. I might just make one last uh, comment, if you don't mind. People have asked me, why do we do this? Why do we go to Geneva, for example, and hear them bash Israel every year and come away and shake our heads and say, did we do any good? And I, my answer to them is, well, if no other reason, if we don't change any minds, at least we are their conscience and they know somebody's looking over their shoulders. And to me, that makes it worthwhile to, to be involved in the neighborhood work. Gentlemen, you are doing fabulous work on behalf of the Jewish people. It's an honor for me to sit with you. Alan Kolkuba Hatzlacha, Dan, once Good again, morning. wonderful to be with you, and thank, thank you very, very much. You have a seat at this table anytime. You continue to keep us informed of what B'nai B'rith International is doing. And on your 170th birthday, Mazal Tov from strength to strength. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you both thank very, very much. My conversation with Alan Jacobs and Daniel Mariashin, President and Executive Vice President of B'nai B'rith International, a Jewish organization making a profound difference on the American and world Jewish scene. I'm Mark Golub. Please stay with us. Shalom TV, television worth watching for the entire family. With the best in entertainment, culture, movies, Jewish studies, children's programs, news, events, and interviews. Shalom TV, television really worth watching. I'm Mark Golub, and every now and then you come across a sort of renaissance type of individual who seems to have talents in a broad array of human endeavors, and that describes the individual I'm extremely pleased to be sitting with now, Alfred Tauber, Dr. Tauber, a professor emeritus of philosophy and a professor emeritus of medicine at Boston University. Alfred Tauber was director of the Center for Philosophy and History of Science from 1993 until 2010, where he taught the history and philosophy of science, the philosophy of biology and medicine, and American philosophy. In 2008, he was awarded the Science Medal from the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Bologna for his critical studies of immunology, and he received an honorary doctorate from Haifa University in 2011. And speaking of Haifa University, Alfred Tauber was recently appointed Chairman of the Board of Governors of Haifa University. And Fred, it's such a great pleasure and honor for me to sit with you. Thank you for joining us. You're very kind, and I'm delighted to be here. So can I talk <laughs> about the um, first who you are and how you come to have this w unusual uh, array of interests where you are, first of all, you, you are a trained physician. You specialized in immunology? Hematology. Hematology. Correct. But you did work, I mentioned the award you received, yes. and it was in immunology. Correct. So what fields, how, how did your career in medicine develop? It's confusing, but I'll try to be brief and, and give you an orientation. Uh, I was, and I think I still identify as an academic physician. Uh, and that means essentially that one does clinical work, yes. education, uh, and run a research laboratory. And the research laboratory was in basic immunology. It was an inflammation. It was concerned with how the body defends itself against infections. And I always was interested in immunology, which is a very broad area, primarily because my mother suffered from asthma. Uh, and I decided, in fact, to do immunology uh, to uh, uh, address her problem. And it obviously was deeply emotional, intellectually satisfying, professionally rewarding, and in the end, I gave it up. And I gave it up in, in, in the sense that I gave up the active laboratory work, but I morphed and reinvented myself as a philosopher of science. And I was interested in broader questions. Such uh, as? Well, I wanted to understand, first of all, the, uh, the, what I call the infrastructure of immunology's theory. I wanted to understand how the theory developed. I wanted to understand its assumptions. And I was mainly interested in its failings. 
its failings. In its failings. Interesting. And uh, that's really the basis of science. Science is always pursuing the question, the weakness. And um, in philosophy of science, essentially, uh, you ask the same question. Uh, what are the assumptions that may be correct or incorrect? And I essentially established a field of, of study of looking at immune theory uh, from a historical and philosophical perspective. And that's what the award was. All right, I want to come back to that in a moment. All right, fine. But first, <laughs> first you mentioned, and I, I find it so real, that it was your mother's asthma which in some way prompted you to take a certain professional track. Yes. Who was your mother? What was her name? Her name was Lily Manaville. She was born in Berlin in 1920 really? to Hungarian uh, natives. Uh, her father, uh, Alfred Manaville, whom I'm named after, uh, he died three years before I was born in the Budapest ghetto. Uh, he was a banker, uh, very successful in Weimar, Germany. Uh, he ran the stock exchange for the, Man of, uh, for the Mendelssohn Bank, and uh, he died penniless. And uh, that's a story. Oh, is that a story? How that's does a somebody very, who runs a bank end up penniless? Well, he, when he left Germany in 1934 because yeah. of Hitler, uh, he went back to Hungary. Uh, he started a private bank. I see. And he had a partner. And the family uh, legend is that the partner ran off to Australia with the money. And my grandfather paid back all the investors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The truth is, of course, to survive the war uh, was a miracle in itself. Yes. My parents were married in 1940 in Budapest. Who's your father? My father, Laszlo Tauber, uh, was a surgeon. And they survived, basically, because he was appointed the surgeon-in-chief of the Red Cross Hospital in Budapest, which was under Swedish control and so under Swedish protection. Uh, he then came with my mother in 1947 to the United States. And but they survived the war. They survived in the Europe. war in, in Europe. And he uh, established a practice in Washington, D.C., where I grew up. This may be more detailed than you like. No, but I love I, it. I, I will, love it. I love it. I will end it very quickly by saying uh, that he took all of the money he made, invested it in real estate, and became a very wealthy man. Good for him. Uh, he was on the Forbes 400 and had the extraordinary good fortune of becoming a great American patriot. That is lovely. What kind of Jewish home did your parents create for you? What did you grow up in? Conflicted. Uh, my mother was a totally assimilated German Jew. Uh, I don't really think she knew Shema until uh, she uh, uh, was faced with my bar mitzvah. Um, my father grew up in a kosher home, and he knew the basic liturgy, and he was actually quite well versed. He went to a uh, what we would call a Jewish day school, neolog. Uh, his mother and uncle ran a kosher butchery in Budapest known for its fine meat. And I remember uh, one of my earliest memories ever was going to the synagogue with him on Rosh Hashanah and observing serious people crying. And um, it made it a big touched impression. You, didn't it? Yeah, very deeply, mm -hmm. very deeply. And did you develop, first of all, I should ask you, are you an only child or you have siblings? I have a sister. My sister Ingrid lives in San Francisco. And Older or younger? She's younger. She's a clinical psychologist. Very nice. As you and your sister grew up, did you feel that there was a sense of Jewish identity being passed on? Was Jewish identity important to you and your sister? It's a very difficult question to answer, Fair honestly. Enough, yeah. I will say uh, the following. Uh, we went to Israel for the first time in 1961 as a bar mitzvah present. I returned in 1964, did the kibbutz thing. I wanted to stay. Uh, came back. Uh, my life caught up with me. Uh, we had a, uh, uh, an orthodox period, my wife and I. Uh, we sent our children to Maimonides School in Boston. Mm -hmm. Your uh, wife's name? Uh, my first wife is Alice. Okay. My second wife is Paula. Okay. Uh, Alice and I had four children. And all I can tell you is that I sent them to Maimonides and we became observant because I wanted them to have a much stronger Jewish identity than I did. Uh, but as the decades have rolled by, 
Uh, eventually, we've made Aliyah, Paula and I. We live in Jerusalem for seven months of the year. She teaches at Hebrew University. I teach at Tel Aviv. That's fabulous. And that's how I got involved with the University of Haifa, finally getting to the <laughs> University of Haifa. <laughs> that's a wonderful story, and yeah. it's a lovely journey. By the way, it's not a unique journey, but at the same no. time, not many people have had the opportunity to sort of travel the journey you've had. So, kolakavo to you, and I wish you all the best. That's very, very lovely, Fred. Okay, come back now for one moment to immunology for me. Oh, yes, immunology. Uh, okay. When I hear about immunology, what comes to my mind right away is cancer research. I don't, you, it did, you did not mention that, so I assume you were not involved specifically in cancer research. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. But can I ask you, since you're here and you know so much, at the moment, as you look at this field of medicine, where do you feel we are? in trying to find ways to really reduce the scourge of cancer? Cancer involves the most basic mechanisms of biology. And there is a strong emphasis now on what is called translational research. In other words, to get a grant funded, the investigator must give the agency good reason to believe mm -hmm. that his or her research will be translated almost immediately into something applicable. I think that's a very bad approach. I think that losing the orientation towards basic research um, is, is crucial. Uh, and fundamentally, after essentially a century of attacking cancer uh, as, a, uh, as an object of chemical modification, strikes me as probably a, uh, a beaten horse and we need to use another approach. And immunology is one such biological orientation. The body normally surveys itself, and when it finds malignant cells, uh, they are usually destroyed. This is called immune surveillance. And the immune surveillance mechanism uh, needs to be understood better, and it needs to be uh, used as a natural way of uh, curing one of cancer if possible. So, Fred, does it come down to, as so many things in this world, an issue of money? It's really an issue of what I call um, a philosophical orientation. Ah. <laughs> There's a certain ideology uh, at present. Uh, there is an enormous industrial complex, if you will, of a commitment to a particular orientation towards cancer therapy. And that gets in the way of progress. Well, it gets in the way or innovation, of, alter maybe. of alternative mm -hmm. approaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's try to be fair. Okay, okay. If I had the good fortune to have been at Boston when you were there teaching either philosophy of medicine or philosophy in general, and I was in a course where you were combining your interest in medicine and your interest in philosophy, what are the kind of issues you would have me as one of your students try to consider? In terms of medicine, the idea that I always tried to push was the doctor-patient relationship being sacrosanct. And I think that probably is a Jewish theme. The idea of treating a disease as opposed to treating a person always struck me as uh, inappropriate. And the idea of medicine uh, having medical ethics as a subspecialty always struck me as strange. It's true we have special uh, situations which require deliberation of a, of, a, of a professional sort, but everything in medicine is fundamentally ethical. And I have taught my students that medicine is primarily an ethical enterprise, and the science and the technology are in service to the moral mandate of caring for the patient. And that's an ethical lesson. And that's what I uh, have emphasized in my writings uh, the deal with medical ethics. That is one of the most beautiful articulations of what medicine and a physician is all about. And it makes me just want to give you the biggest hug. You know, we, we <laughs> talked for a moment. very generous. No, no, we talked outside the uh, studio for a moment. And, you know, I've had my own medical history. And I have experienced so many different physicians um, in different disciplines and, you know, some with amazing mm. reputations. And the way you describe what medicine should be is what I wish every physician at every level, 
every specialty understood. It was a very beautiful articulation. And so we'll just stand this for one more moment. From your perspective, what are one or two of the most serious errors you think physicians make in not understanding they're treating the whole person, that they're not supposed to be treating a disease, and that what disappoints you in one or two areas in the way medicine is practiced here in America? I've written a book. I'm going to send it to you. It's called Confessions of a Medicine Man. Thank you. I look forward to it. And uh, there you will find a, a rich harvest of, of issues. Uh, the first and primary uh, concern of a physician should be the advocacy of the patient's interests. And in this day and age of managed care, that is sometimes uh, forgotten. Uh, every patient needs an advocate. And physicians now have, unfortunately, divided loyalties. Many of them are hired. Uh, they work for institutions or insurance companies or government. And the patient, of course, is now a client or a consumer or a covered life. And I think the advocacy question is absolutely critical. Uh, the second one, which is also social, uh, pertains to the physician's role uh, within a healthcare team and the communication between doctors, nurses, other physicians and all the other ancillaries is absolutely crucial. And even with the electronic uh, medical record and all of the uh, uh, web-based modes of communication, uh, sometimes just picking up the phone or meeting someone in the hall is the best way of dealing with the problem. I want to relate to you an experience I had. It's Please. anecdotal but I want to get a sense from you as to whether it resonates up in being symptomatic of a larger problem. And I may not be fair, so I really want to hear what you have to say. I'm going to contrast for you the experience I've had as a patient in the American system as opposed to the Israeli system. And I want to know, again, whether what I'm saying you feel is, is true in a broad sense or was it just anecdotally true for me? Again, I've had some complicated issues. In America, my experience has been that every physician who treated me, and they came in with, from, they came in with different specialties. They had specific areas of their expertise that they were dealing with my, my overall body. But every one of them dealt with that specific piece of my biology. Mm -hmm. And very often, one of the things that frustrated me and my family was there was no sense that they were talking with each other. I have an issue in Israel. When it came to my experience in Israel, nothing would be done to me until a team that was dealing with various aspects of the overall problem I was confronting met and a decision was made. And only then was a certain treatment given a hexer, was given, uh, okay, now you can go ahead and do this, that, or with the other thing. Mm -hmm. And it struck me and my family that there was a very different sense of collaboration in medicine in Israel that, did, that was not true in America. And I want to make sure the audience does not misunderstand me. I've had fabulous doctors here in America, just outstanding human beings and wonderful diagnosticians and technicians. And I am not critical of them as individuals. What I am saying is the process is something that does give me concern. And maybe I just had a lucky situation in Israel, but I'm asking you whether this collaboration that I experienced in Israel among specialists from different fields, which I did not experience in the United States, do you feel in any way it typifies the American medical establishment as opposed to the Israeli medical establishment? Israeli medicine almost mimics American medicine. Uh, virtually no academic physician can get an appointment in an Israeli university hospital setting without having done his formal training, and I'm referring to his postgraduate training in the United States. So the uh, technology, uh, the uh, philosophical uh, and social approaches to medicine are almost identical. What is different is the medical system which in Israel is uh, uh, the stepchild of a socialist orientation 
uh, where everyone is insured, where everyone is cared for, where physicians make very modest salaries, and which uh, functions within s generally smaller institutions than what we find here in America. And that is obviously going to have a big effect because the so-called balance of powers uh, changes, uh, the financial structure changes, and so the services change. Um, does that really translate into a more comprehensive medicine? It may well. I cannot cite a study. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you my own personal experience, uh, but it doesn't surprise me. Okay. I admit this is purely anecdotal, but it is an interesting experience that I had and I wanted to share it with you. Okay, so now you are the chairman of the Board of Governors of Haifa University. I read about you, and I know you taught at Tel Aviv University? Correct. Okay. So can you tell me, first of all, why do you say yes when they come <laughs> to you to take the position of the chair of the Board of Governors? And what experience did you have at Haifa? Because obviously you did have experience at Tel yes. Aviv. The, um, it's a long story. And in fact, I'm not sure I can give you an honest answer uh, because I don't know. Uh, these major decisions are largely emotional and irrational, or at least irrational. So, but we'll take a stab. Uh, we've been involved in psychiatric rehabilitation work in Israel. Uh, that's a complicated story, but basically the University of Haifa had the best department. Uh, and they uh, uh, did research for us, and we decided to get involved in their educational programs, supporting uh, master's students, PhD students, postdoctorals, and I became very impressed with the university. It's a very interesting institution. Uh, it's up there in the north, where uh, it serves a population which is really a reflection of Israel. It has 23% uh, Arabs. Uh, it has a campus at B'nai Brak for the Haredi. Uh, it has lots of Russian students, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but aside from its demography, uh, it represents a center of excellence in many areas. And one thing led to another, mm -hmm. and I got involved in science there. As it turned out, with bioinformatics, uh, I became friends with the president, uh, who was a philosopher, and he uh, encouraged me to teach there, which I did for a short time. So I knew the university, and they knew me. Okay, fast forward, 2012. They're looking for a new chairman. Leon Charney, here of New York, mm -hmm. uh, had served for six years, mm -hmm. and the Constitution states it has to, he has to be replaced. So they're asking everybody, and everyone is smarter or busier than I am. Uh, we had made Aliyah, and I was looking for something that would be challenging and rewarding. And this struck me as a, as a good opportunity, because the president, who is the former head of El Al, Airlines and the former uh, CEO of a cell phone company uh, was not an academic. Ami Ayalon, the admiral, politician, head of the Shin Bet, who's the chairman of the executive committee, is not an academic. And so I said, listen, you need me as an academic. I'm going to be interested in helping you develop priorities and policy. And it was on that basis that I accepted the opportunity. Well, they are so lucky to have you. And as you look at your job now, as you look at where you are now, and you know, it's interesting, there are many universities that are known worldwide. In America, there are universities which Jews know, you know, and, but Haifa University hasn't yet reached the same level of name recognition in the American Jewish community that other correct. places has. Absolutely correct. And I'm wondering what you think, you know, if you had to identify one or two of the challenges that you hope in the years of your tenure, you're able to address what would they be? And one of the things that, one of the reasons why I'm so glad you're here is I want people to understand more about Haifa University. But, you know, where are the areas you would like to see movement as you now begin your, your tenure? The North is clearly a periphery. Uh, it's an area in Israel which needs further development, uh, it needs a stronger Jewish presence. Um, and the University of Haifa is poised to serve that population. And uh, universities are generators of industry. Uh, the University of Haifa is particularly strong in what I would call uh, professional training, law, business administration, nursing, social work, 
um, and various others. And these are its strengths. The university is actually quite young. It's only 40 years old. It began as an outpost of the Hebrew University in the late 60s. And then in 1972, it was incorporated as a separate university. And the reason that it's not well known is hidden in that history. Because when the university began, it was decided it would focus, and it has continued to strengthen itself in this area, in humanities and social sciences. And the sciences were done at the Technion, which if one is a bird, one can fly down in, in a moment. It's less than a kilometer away, uh, just down the, uh, down the mountain. And the idea was it would be a collaboration between the two institutions. Science would be done at the Technion, social science, humanities, and all the other supportive disciplines would be done on the top of the hill. Well, as it turns out, the uh, top of the hill uh, did not develop a strong science until about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's where universities are known. They're known for the breakthroughs that are done in research. They're known for the headlines of, of, of innovations in, in technology. And so the University of Haifa uh, was subordinate uh, relative to the other universities in Israel. However, in the past few years, it has made a strong commitment to uh, marine science, uh, to neuroscience, to bioinformatics, to evolutionary biology, uh, and to various other areas related to uh, education uh, and social work. And so I think that the profile uh, will become self-evident uh, in the near future that this is a multifocal uh, university uh, which has many centers of excellence. That is wonderful. By the way, we should mention, because you mentioned Leon Charney, his passion was marine science. Correct. And he did an extraordinary job creating at Haifa University the home department of marine science. Correct. And the other thing that I am very impressed with is the extent to which Haifa University really does incorporate, does embrace a large Arab-Israeli population. And that there seems to be a, at Haifa University a model for what the best could one day be of Israeli Jew and Arab Jew living side by side, learning side by side, working side by side. And I wonder if, the, if you've experienced that yourself. I am very intrigued by the, both the challenge and the opportunity of the University of Haifa being a crucible for the integrative and harmonious relationship. Uh, between the two populations. And I think every day uh, you just walk through the campus and you see Jews and Arabs studying together, faculty which is mixed, and a very strong sense that this is a special place. You're a very special soul. It has been a pleasure meeting you. I wish you called Tuva Hatzlaka only great success at Haifa University. I love talking medicine with you. I love talking philosophy with you. I love talking Haifa University with you. I hope we get to sit together many, many times, and I get to see you personally off camera as well. Thank you so much. For Thank me. you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My conversation with Alfred Tauber, Dr. Tauber, Chairman of the Board of Governors of Haifa University. Again, it's a university which will gain extreme recognition over the coming years here in the American Jewish community. And of course, I hope if you're ever in Israel, one of the things you make a point of doing if you're in the Haifa area is getting to see Haifa University. As always, I invite any of you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have of your own to things said on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. 
and we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.